Hi. Uh, today we're going to be going on in our Genesis reading. We're going to cover the story of Abraham, which is Genesis chapters 12 through 24. That's your reading for our discussion tomorrow. This is of a quite different character than Genesis 1 through 10, which is telling stories that have universal application to human beings. There's the flood, the Tower of Babel. Um, this isn't about any one specific group of people. This is about the world. Beginning with chapter 12, we have the story that will take up basically the rest of the Hebrew Bible, which is the story of God's work with his people, the people of Israel. And the father and founder of that people is Abraham, and that is why he has such importance. You'll see this right off the bat in chapter 12. Um, now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So actually you do see a little bit of a return of this kind of global concern, right? That there's this story of Abram, the people that come from him, and the idea that that will be a blessing to the whole earth. So we're not leaving behind global concerns, but we're much more focused on God and his people. Um, this uh, this is going to be the, throughout the story of Abraham, really the tension is going to be the delay between the promise of what God is going to do and then the actual working of that out with the arrival of a son. And in between those two things, there's going to be a lot of kind of stutter steps uh, or missteps as Abram believes and doesn't believe and um, responds in faith to what God has said, but that is going to be really the tension. And each of the stories that you're that you're going to read in this section have some level of connection to that promise that God is making. God's either restating the promise, or Abram is trying to figure out um, uh, what to do about the delay of that promise in the Bible. The story of David, the story of Joseph, where there's a nice arc and a narrative. And this is more episodic. It's like a mosaic of stories that are kind of being woven together and telling the story of Abraham. All right, so realize that going in, that there's things that don't seem fully connected. It's not like um, this is some kind of uh, direct, uh, simple piece of storytelling. It appears that these are stories that have been gathered from some different locations, brought together and kind of pushed up against each other um, in order to build uh, to build the story. Um, one of I want to mention is the theme of land. And that's something that's, so God is going to make out of Abraham a great nation, and that nation is going to have a land or a place, right? Um, you see this also in chapter 12 with the initial statement of the promise. Uh, you see, um, uh, actually chapter 13, but right at the beginning of this, the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, raise your eyes now and look from the place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward, for all the land that you see, I will give to you and to your offspring forever. So here is this connection between you're going to be a people and you're also going to have this land. Um, and those are um, that's an interesting and powerful connection that's made in the Hebrew Bible and something that is still with us today in what in our mind as ideas about the Holy Land, right? There's some sense of connection and calling and purpose in this plot of land. And uh, if you travel to um, Jerusalem today, you'll see these kind of Abrahamic faiths kind of wrestling with how to deal with this, with the land and these claims and counterclaims as far as communities and groups and their connection to that pretty small plot of ground. Um, uh, let's look to Genesis chapter 18 and 19. Now I've mentioned this kind of mosaic character of the whole thing, but there are also parts which are just beautifully woven and put together. Um, chapters 18 and 19 is one. And I'd offer, ask you to think of these as this kind of linked narrative. Um, you, we begin in chapter 18 with the Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre as he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, 
he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, my Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under me. Let me bring a little bread that you may refresh yourselves. And after that, pass on since you have come to your servant. So they said, do as you have said. And Abraham hastened into the tent of Sarah and said, make ready, make ready quickly three measures of choice flour, knead it and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the servant who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. Now, Genesis isn't a novel and it doesn't go into too many details, but there's this like flood of details that all of a sudden come at us in this passage. And I would um, suggest that part of what's going on here is there's a point being made about hospitality. Abraham is not in a city. He's a, in a pastoral, more um, uh, country situation. And the values of that place that he's living in the, in the hills outside of cities is hospitality. And so we get all these details showing, look at the hospitality of Abraham. Um, and I would suggest that's this ethic that characterizes, should characterize the, the, the people of Abraham. Um, uh, next, you know, like I've mentioned, there's always this tension of when is this promise going to be fulfilled? Um, why is there this delay? And we get the novels, but we get here is in verse, verse 12, Sarah laughed to herself saying, after I've grown old and my husband is old, shall I have pleasure? And, and there's a sense of why this delay, what is happening here? But it's being told um, not through kind of declarative statements about what's happening, but rather through, you know, personal responses of the characters. And this is something that I would invite you to think of as a literary mastery that's going on here in the text in um, communicating that tension and delay um, through these small uh, elements of character. Um, finally, there's the debate with God. So we find out that these three men aren't just out for a walk in the afternoon, but are heading towards Sodom and Gomorrah, where they are going to rain down judgment and destroy these cities. And we get this um, kind of back and forth between Abraham and the Lord. Again, it's a very kind of primitive version of the Lord because he's like there in person. Um, Abraham is debating, well, if there's so many, then maybe you shouldn't kill all those people. And then God saying, well, okay, I agree. And that he whittles them down in this debate until he gets to um, uh, just 10 people. If there are 10 righteous people in this city, then God agrees not to destroy it. Okay, so this is this, chapter 18 is this vision of the pastoral world of Abraham. And I would say that that's the world that is ideally this kind of ideal path of Israel. Next, we move to the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, which is where um, Abram's nephew Lot is living. Here is the exact opposite. Um, the two angels came to Sodom in the evening. This is at the start of chapter 19. And Lot was sitting in the gateway of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them, bowed down with his face to the ground. He said, please, my lords, turn aside your servant's house, spend the night, wash your feet, then you can rise early and go on your way. So we enter a city and there's this kind of... Um, uh, place in the city at the uh, at the gate at the entrance, and whether they can be raped essentially. And here we have what what I would argue is this kind of a sense of urban decay, basically that's being that's being shown here. And um, Lot and his family are going to have to leave, and then these cities, the cities of the plain, God is going to rain down fire and destroy these cities from the face of the earth. But it's really it's the city character that we're that we're that we're seeing here. Um, uh, verse twenty four: The Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah sulfur and fire. He overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and what grew on the ground. So um, we have kind of two ways of life that are being juxtaposed here: the hospitable pastoral side, and then the non-hospitable, in fact, the complete opposite of hospitable, the, the malicious and aggressive cities of the plain. Sometimes Sodom and Gomorrah, the story gets read as being about homosexuality. And I would say that if, you know, reading this in context, it's about these kinds of value systems that are, that are at war. Um, and it's really the, the rape of these men, the aggressive action against them that is uh, in the mind of the the writer of Genesis. And that's the way it's used elsewhere 
uh, in the Hebrew Bible as well as this kind of aggressive, non-hospitable side. Um, one other thing is who are these cities of the plain? If you look at the end of chapter 19, um, you'll see the firstborn bore a son and named him Moab. He is the ancestor of the Moabites to this day. So part of the reason people often miss this when they're reading Genesis is that we talk about Geertz and this kind of con concepts of the general order of existence. Well, one thing Genesis is doing is explaining what is the difference between Israelites and then all these people that are are around them. Um, and a lot of the characters that are extraneous to Abraham represent other places in this narrow area of land. And Lot represents the Moabites. He's the ancestor to Moab, and it's Moab who gives his name to the Moabites. So this is one way, it's sort of like someone writing for the United States, and there's a character named Canada, or a character named Mexico, or a character named um, uh, well, those were our two bordering countries. I don't have a lot of options, but you you get the sense that you kind of have characters that are being used to kind of um, set up and explain why groups are the way they are, right? And Lot um, is kind of okay. He's kind of on the side of Abraham, but he's also the uh, ancestor of Moab and the Moabite people. Okay, now what, so your reading is from 12 to 24. I want you especially to take a look at the very well-known story, and it's going to be at the heart of our discussion tomorrow, which is the, the story of Abraham and the binding of Isaac. This is in chapter 22. And in your groups, I want you to answer one of two questions. If you're in group A, B, and C, A, B, and C, then your question to decide among yourselves is, what are the literary qualities of this chapter? Where are some details which take this from being just a plain story into something that has literary quality? Where is there a particularly beautiful way of describing things or something that's unexpected in the, in, 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 in the way the internal views and experience of this is being depicted that give it literary qualities? That's for A, B, C. If your group's D, E, F, then I'd like you to ask yourselves and come up with a question about what is the ethical point of this story? How is How are we uh, as individuals, as readers of this text, uh, what kind of message are we supposed to take out of it, especially on the kind of ethical plane? How should I act after reading this story? What is the message about human beings and their ethical response to God. And I think this is an important question because this is a passage that especially connects to violence. And, you know, God in this case is commanding violence. And what exactly is the kind of ethical pull away for how human beings should uh, respond to God and respond to others? Is there an ethical point, All right? Um, that's what you're discussing in your groups. And I look forward to our live discussions uh, tomorrow. All right, talk to you later.